I awoke to a distant tapping sound, which stopped a few moments after I opened my eyes. Beneath that noise was the familiar reverberating hum I'd grown accustomed to, but that tapping sound was unsettling and new. The International Space Station was constantly filled with noise. The most prominent, a droning hum reminiscent of being trapped inside a powerful vacuum cleaner. The blinds were closed and darkness permeated every inch of my phone booth sized living space. Blinking my eyes a few more times, I looked at the glowing face of my watch and saw it was still early. Not yet 5am. We operated on a 24 hour day despite the fact that we witnessed 16 sunrises in that span of time. If not for the simulated days, you'd lose your mind from perpetual jet lag. Our days began at 6 a.m. and finished at 9 p.m., the long shifts symbolic of the workload to be done in the short amount of time we had aboard the ISS. Our days were broken down into five-minute increments. Our schedules consisted mostly of experiments and associated documentation, Meal times, video chats, and personal hygiene. Everything was meticulously scheduled into five minute chunks, all the way down to our bathroom breaks. Closing my eyes, I tried to go back to dreaming. My sleeping bag hovered in the air, held down by a strap so that it didn't float away in zero gravity, and so that I didn't bump into other people. With ten crew members on board, real estate was at a premium. The space station was built for six but there have been as many as 13 people aboard all at once. Each warm body brings a share of food, toiletries, and clothing, supplies which all take up precious space. Which is why it was so obvious to me when a stowaway insidiously came aboard the ISS. Someone lurking in the shadows who was not supposed to be there. An 11th crew member, unaccounted for. I would see them out of the corner of my eye like a mirage in the desert, only for them to disappear a second later. Always just a glimpse, never right in front of me. Whoever it was, they were clever, and extremely good at disguising themselves. Like an octopus, they blend in with the colors of the walls and fit into vents and difficult places. This is all difficult to believe, I'm sure, but it's true. When I told the crew, I expected them to be incredulous. Instead, it sounded like everyone had quietly begun to suspect the same things. Noticing movements in the shadows, rustling sounds and missing items. Food and water, clothing and other more personal things. At first we all thought it was a rogue crew member, a kleptomaniac cosmonaut with a penchant for taking too many rations and stealing dirty clothing. But after several crew meetings and weeks of careful observation, it became obvious that was not the case. None of us were stealing the supplies, we were sure of that much. Tap, tap, tap. The sound came again. With it, a knocking noise. Like a creaking pipe releasing pressure on a cold night. Hair stood up on the back of my neck as I listened to that noise reverberating throughout the cabin. It was familiar, but I couldn't place it. Getting out of my sleeping bag, I began to head towards that sound, floating out of the tranquility node and guiding myself from handhold to handhold in the darkness. The hygiene and sleeping quarters were quiet, aside from the occasional sound of snoring. Tap, tap, tap. The noise came again, and I tried to stay as silent as possible as I ran out a corner and went left. I continued to propel myself along through the American Laboratory module, hovering past the expensive equipment and specimen containers. I wondered vaguely if the sound was coming from the Japanese lab. It seemed to be emanating from ahead and to the left. But no one was scheduled to be in there at this time. Opening the airlock door, I entered Kaibo. The Japanese laboratory was empty, despite the sounds I had just heard coming from inside. Knock, knock, knock. Another noise. From behind me now. I spun around, dripping sweat which rolled off my temples and beads and floated upwards towards the ceiling. My heart drumming madly in my chest, I put my feet against the walls to push myself off, like a swimmer in a pool of water. 
I began to float back towards the entrance of Kaibo. Echoes could be funny in the ISS. And I told myself it was fine. The noise, whatever it was, was just coming from the European laboratory module. The Columbus. That was where it had been coming from all along. I had just misjudged the sound. So I began to float over that way, trying to ignore my anxiety and nerves. Trying to forget about the voice in my head saying that none of this made sense. None of this was normal. What if someone woke up right now? I wondered. Would they suspect me of being the one stealing food and supplies? Quite possibly. I tried to think of what to say if anyone found me awake, and decided I would tell them I wanted to get in a bit of early exercise. This was reasonable, since we had to spend two hours per day working out in order to prevent muscle and bone loss, and to prevent fluid from seeping up into the subcutaneous tissue around our skulls. The space snuffles, we call them. Either way, despite what it might look like, I needed to see what was making that noise, and to find out if it had anything to do with our mystery stowaway. Suddenly, the tapping noise stopped, and instead there was a sound like fingernails scraping across a chalkboard, squealing louder and louder by the second. The sound retreated from beneath me, back the way I had come towards the Tranquility Node. I pulled myself as quickly as I could across Node 2, where our life support systems and electrical equipment were. Beneath me, the sound like claws rending steel continued to scrape along the hull, beneath the space station, and I wondered what sort of damage was being done, and what could be causing such a horrifying sound. Others were beginning to wake up now, and I could see lights turning on in the Tranquility Node as I swam through the air in zero gravity, making my way through the U.S. laboratory. As I did, I decided to take a look out through the observation window, trying to see what was making such a horrifying sound. I hit the control switch, and the blind covering the window beneath me opened up. Staring out through the glass, I saw the stars and Earth below us. But then I saw something else as well. Something much closer. One of my fellow crew members was out there, frozen in the vacuum of space. His shocked visage scraped past the window, making that sound like broken fingernails on a chalkboard. I can't say his name here, so I'll just call him David. Some sort of black tentacle was wrapped around his throat and face. It was dark as the night sky, trailing off invisible into the distance, like a huge black squid. The thing was dragging him away from the ship, causing that tapping sound, and the scraping sound, as his frozen corpse banged and dragged against the space station's hull. As I thought about this, the black tentacles dug spikes deeper into his blue-tinged neck and he began to drift off, disappearing out of sight. A moment later, he was gone, like a bad nightmare I had just woken up from, and wished only to forget. If only I could. What are you looking at out there? A voice asked me from the other end of the U.S. laboratory, ahead of me. Another crew member had woken up from all the noise, I thought, and now I would have to try and somehow explain what I had just seen. It's David. He's... Tears were welling up in my eyes, turning into floating bubbles, and I trailed off, unsure how to continue. Then I looked up to see the same man who had just died outside in the freezing vacuum of space. David. Right there in front of me. He was alive and well, hovering in front of me like a ghost. David? Yeah, what's wrong with you? What was that noise, anyways? Did you find our stowaway? The smile on his face told me everything I needed to know. His skin seemed to shift and squirm, bulges appearing like large insects tunneling beneath the surface. But I had no time to confront him, as others began to emerge from the sleep quarters moments later, asking why we were up so early. I shook my head slowly, still not sure if I should believe my eyes. 
There's a sound. A tapping sound. The more I thought about it, the more it all seemed like a dream. Had I been asleep when I thought I was awake? Was it possible for one to sleepwalk in space? To sleep levitate? No. I shook that feeling off quickly. I knew what I had seen. Maybe we should call it in. Find out if something happened. Said David. If you're sure that's what you heard. I'm sure. Everyone agreed and we notified Mission Control. They informed us after a full diagnostic check that all systems were operating normally. Only one strange thing had occurred overnight while we were sleeping. The exit hatch used for our spacewalks had been opened by someone. Then closed a moment later. Just long enough to toss somebody out, I guessed. Nobody admitted to it, leaving us all slightly uneasy. Oddly, though, afterwards our rationing problems were solved. Food stopped going missing after that. We had just enough of everything for ten people again. As if the invisible stowaway had suddenly disappeared. Or as if he'd gotten rid of someone else and taken their place. I can't prove anything. But I'll have to keep a very close eye on David when he gets back to Earth. I'm not sure what else I can do besides monitor him. Whatever he is, he's dangerous. And there could be more out there like him. Who knows? They might already be here, living among us. And there are more living up in our atmosphere. Like the one who took David. Body snatchers, skin walkers, doppelgangers. Whatever you want to call them. You've heard about them before. The tales of them are endless. And you can read all about them online. Stories of others who have survived encounters with them. I get the feeling many of them are true. And these creatures are all one and the same. Or they're related somehow. So keep your guard up. Don't be fooled. And most importantly, don't let them inside. Because by then, it's already too late. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blarian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajetti, Bert Turner, Bajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Gary Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Windy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gem Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, Casey Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishdollar, Cloves Annoy Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brooke, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, Professor Elm, Kathy Berrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, Melanie Sanders, The Archivist, Rob Smith, Term 4, Naz Razio, J. David Wellman Jr., Parker Lewis, Monica Moya, Dmaster311, Britt the Alchemist, Taylor the Fox, Holly Howarth, Julia McWilliam, Lilypad, Miss Peltier, and Diego Rodriguez. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos, content, and a Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. 
and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.